Dear colleagues, dear colleagues, uh, welcome everyone in the annual conference of the ASA. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to see you here. It's nice to see the most dedicated, most enthusiastic uh, people of this community. And it's good to see friends. I hope you enjoyed the last night, an excellent icebreaker, which was presented by our amazing host in an amazing environment. Speaking of which, first I would like to introduce and invite on the stage our host, uh, Tiago Fierotti, Zoom Marine Board member. Good morning, everyone. It is very, it is early. I hope everyone had a strong coffee. <laughs> so. Dear Chair, dear Andrew Pop, dear friends, dear attendees of the Annual Conference of the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums, dear colleagues, welcome to Portugal. It is an extraordinary honor to welcome to the Algarve and to Zoomarine so many experts in so many remarkable technical and scientific fields. Over the years, it has been a great pleasure to host many international scientific events. Our very first being the annual conference of the European Association of Aquatic Mammals in March 1996, only five years after Zoomarine's opening. Since then, our team has welcomed almost 20 international symposia, workshops, and conferences. Today, shortly after a celebration of our own 20th anniversary, we couldn't be any more proud to welcome the 30th Annual Conference of IASA. As I'm sure you already are aware, tradition will be maintained. An amazing and very intense conference is about to start. However, we tried our very best to make sure that you also have a very personal and memorable experience in southern Portugal and to, at the Marine. Needless to say, during the incoming five days, the opportunities to network, to learn, to suggest, to share experiences, and to grow as professionals are endless. My father and I and our team must urge you to try to experience the most of what the Algarve and Portugal has to offer. And you'll find that we have a lot of concentrated diversity, a lot of concentrated biodiversity. And please make sure to save some time to experience our delicious gastronomy, amazing landscapes, remarkable traditions, and indisputable hospitality. Such hospitality includes a visit to a very special dream that my father has been building over the last 40 years, Zumarin Algarve. For you, our doors are and always will be open. Enjoy the day of the visit, not only as professionals, but also through the eyes of fathers and mothers, or even through the eyes of a child, which you know is the best proof that we are on the right, right path. Feel free to ask, feel free to suggest any cooperation towards animal welfare, sound science, effective conservation, and engaging education towards sustainability. Zumarin is Pedro's dream that came to life and form. It was born with strong foundations towards conservation, education, science, innovation, knowledge, and of, and of course, fun. A special place where visitors can live those rare moments as a family, that leave a mark not only that day, but to a lifetime, where people can learn to respect and protect our oceans, our planets, in a unique way, through love and respect, by respecting what you love, what you know, and loving what you respect. In a world that seems each day more human, nature, and emotional disconnected, where the artificial and the momentary seems to matter more or as much as the real and the long-lasting, where headlines are more important than facts, it is our mission to provide the opportunity to the future generations to learn in first hand, to experience the emotion of connecting to several species, 
connecting to wildlife, and connecting to our planet. It's all for them, so they can learn, understand, and have knowledge to defend our common future. And as a father of two, I can say with all conviction that I believe in the future generations. Next Thursday, you should honor us with your visit, and you might be able to easily understand why dreams are so important, and how dreams can change a city, a region, a team, a species, or even many species. However, dreams alone, alone are not enough. We also need hard work. We need to cooperate. We need to envision the future and work towards it. We need to empower people, give them the tools to build our future and our common goals. There are so many moments in life when we need to step up together and show our values, our work, our commitment, and show the truth, even when many can see it or don't want to. The only way is to stay focused on what really matters and give the best of us each day. And as, as nature teaches us on a daily basis, we need to work together to ensure such fundamental, integral, and delicate balance. We, mo we must work daily while we're respecting cultural diversity, legal diversity, historical diversity, genetic diversity, and even emotional diversity. Fortunately for myself, for my family, and for all entire Zumarino Guard family, our path has been made much easier by a special man, Pedro Lavia. Just as easily and immediately as Pedro Lavia replied to Danny the man, when Danny suggested back in March 2019 to host this, this annual conference, yes, it was settled in less than five seconds. <clears throat> My father is the rock and the force behind many changes in our social ecosystem. For instance, when Pedro came to Portugal in the summer of 1988, legislation regarding animals were, was very different than it is today. There, there was a lack of knowledge, therefore a lack of respect and love. In 2002, there, there was still no rehabilitation center for marine animals in Portugal, either stranded or confiscated. That was just 20 years ago when Zumarin created the first rehabilitation center of its kind in Portugal. Zumarin Portugal and Pedro Lava changed that, changed many policies and behaviors, and many other things. What helped such changes were, uh, were his values, his strength, his convictions, and his faith. I'm sure that, that everyone in this room, directly or indirectly, every day contributes to these needed changes. Yes, life is short but intense, and this is our mark towards the respect of nature environment. Today, we are all here at the beginning of the largest annual conference that EASA <clears throat> has ever hosted, because we, we also share a very important and urgent dream, commitment and cooperation. When one thinks of EASA, we quickly understand that our DNA, just like Zumarin's, has very important basis, commitment and cooperation, hard work, strength, determination, progressive values, and continuous development. In 2022, after a terrible pandemic, while facing a terrible war in Europe and already experiencing the tremendous unfair economic impacts in our personal and professional lives, Cooperation, progress, and commitment seems to be more important than ever. The task ahead of, ahead of us, as individuals and as entities, are tremendous. But if, if there is a group of committed professions that can achieve great goals towards science, towards education and conservation, such group is the IASA. It is us. Us and our in situ and ex situ colleagues and partners. Our collective work in Europe and outside Europe has been the salvation of many species and, and many individuals. EASA has created the foundation of many important new policies, new programs, and new zoological ethics. Zumarin, in its humble but determined ways, has honored the dream of our founding father and developed many institutions, such as EASA. During your visit to our home, 
you may want to discover some of our very special projects. projects. Our rehabilitation center for stranded animals, our programs to, uh, to enrich and reforest the region by planting trees around the Argarve, our beach clean program, our EEPs and conservation programs like Palanges, with, with the goal to save endangered local freshwater fish. And then there are numerous other social dynamics. You, <clears throat> of course, will help us directly. As Zoomerine promised, and we will offer and plant two trees for each attendee at this annual conference. So, being 920 of you, that means 1,840 more trees to be planted in the Algarve. Congratulations. We have been working hard. We have been working hard in the past 30 years, and so have you. And my father and I promise that we will continue to work very hard in the next 30 years, and so will you. As a symbolic gesture of such commitment, in two days, together, we will formally inaugurate our botanic garden. One more special moment to share with all. A highly endangered tree will be planted on September 29, 2022, at our zoo. The tree is a Carvalho de Monchique, <clears throat> and, the, and that is less than 300 individuals nationwide. Having said all this, with your help, with your trust, with your cooperation, every day our values will be defended and our goals will be stronger. Because indeed, together we protect. Welcome to Portugal. Welcome to Zumarine. May you feel at home and may, may you be back many, many times. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the warm welcome. I see, uh, we all see, it's a great facility, great team, uh, excellent organization of the conference. Thank you for that. It's obvious that it was a big dream which came into fruition and you handled it like your baby, like your family. So thank you for that and congratulations. Uh, let me introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, President of Zoomarim, Pedro Lavia, and we are going to see a video from him with a message. Dear friends, dear colleagues, good morning, buenos dias, bon dia, welcome to Portugal. My name is Pedro Lavia, I'm the CEO of the Submarine Portugal. I mean the many traditions, but one of the most many traditions is the COVID. Now I got it, last Friday. I am home recovering. No have the opportunity to see you, but my Santiago representing my two families, San Marin and my family. I hope it's possible that I see you Saturday after the five days and give a big hug to all my friends. Uh, I'm very happy to have the ASA meeting in San Marin in Portugal for first time. Welcome to Portugal. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we are also looking forward to see the president. Uh, let me introduce the next speaker and invite her to the uh, stage. Uh, she is Alexandra Teodosio. She is the vice rector at the University of Algarve. Bom dia a todos. Uh, good morning all. Uh, 
Uh, it's a great uh, honor to the University of Algarve uh, be able to address some words uh, to such a, a distinguished audience uh, within the European Association of Zoos and Aquario Annual Congress. Um, I would like uh, also to do a special uh, acknowledgement to the president of the European uh, Association of the Zoos and Aquario, Indre Papp, uh, the executive director of ISAZO, uh, uh, my friend Glifty, the president of Albufeira Municipality, uh, 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 my friend uh, also, uh, José Carlos Rol, uh, the administration, administrative Administrator of Zoo Marine, Tiago uh, Pierotti, that we just were uh, able to, to, to listen their emotional uh, words. Uh, and uh, 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 especially um, also to Pedro uh, Lavia and to uh, my colleague and, and friend uh, Elio Vicente. Um, uh, allow me a small introduction introduction uh, uh, of the University of, uh, of Algarve. Uh, we are a, a young uh, university, uh, around uh, 42 years old. Uh, we are a medium-sized uh, size university, 10,000 students. Um, and we are uh, located by, by the sea with three uh, campi, uh, embracing the coastal areas, and some of our campi are also in protected uh, 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 areas with uh, paths and itineraries uh, among um, the, the, the protected areas and uh, uh, also involved um, piece of art and, and, and nature. Uh, we are uh, simultaneously an applied science and a research university, so we have an university campus and a polytechnic campus and we're offering all types of degrees in the uh, comprehensive higher education institution. Nevertheless, biology, um, marine science, uh, tourism, um, and management are the University of Algarve's strong areas, both in teaching and research, and uh, recognized by the academic uh, rankings like the Shanghai, uh, the, the Times Higher Education, the World Impact, uh, the World University rank, Ranking, and special, the one that I'm more proud, it's the time higher education impact on sustainable development goals where we are performing uh, in one of the best uh, ways in, in, in Portugal, especially in targeting the uh, SDG uh, 14 to protect our uh, ocean, but also uh, in the quality of education, the uh, sustainable development goal number four. In the last years, we have been uh, able to attract a sig significant and increasing number of students, national students, but also international students. Uh, now we reach 25% of our students are international, um, and uh, we are still recovering from the COVID uh, period. Uh, our students are quite diverse regarding nationalities from more than 90 countries. And this diversity, it's also reflected in the origin of our academics and researchers, stimulating learning in a multicultural context. I would like to thank all national and international colleagues uh, from quite diverse nationalities present here in the ISASA Congress for daily, daily work and net contribution to an effective education for sustainability and conservation. That allow not only the uh, welfare and rescue organisms from inflicted damage, but especially for their contribution in terms of cons conservation, interrupting the long-term paths of ex extinctions of several species. Combining our emotional and rational sides, it's possible to inspire our thinking and transform our actions in new creative ways. We need more knowledge and love for our native biodiversity. Positive stories need to be told and listened and give hope for the protection of natural rights in our planet. That is, will be also um, the way to protect the womankind from different threats, including pandemics. Despite decades of management and conservation efforts, we have seen limited progress in rebuilding nature, both terrestrial and marine ecosystems, 
from human inflicted damage on the global scale. Um, I think that association like yours and this event also will contribute remarkably to, to this uh, um, uh, uh, goal. Our compassion, to, uh, compassion towards the natural life uh, that are suffering from massive tourism, uh, overfishing, ocean acidification, coral bleaching, plastification, fire storms, invasive species, and many others, um, will inspire us to help take action in the, with a positive uh, force. It's necessary to spread non, not only catastrophic events that will not convince the society to change attitudes or to have the needed individual behavior. It's still necessary to show that our actions make difference and can save species. Uh, this is the needed change um, to an Anthropocene that can be achieved in peace with more justice, more prosperous society, which may have new cultures, different social orders uh, without, uh, but we should never imagine in the future without our natural ecosystems uh, and native biodiversity, uh, emerge or submerged forests, microalgae, plankton drifting in the sea, megafauna walking in our mountains or diving in our seas. Uh, more informal education unit, units, um, as the ones that you are, some of you representing here and as Zoo Marine, or more formal ones as uh, our education institutes, such as University of Algarve. We have more than ever a key role in the capacity building for sustainability with a global ambition to impact with an innovative also technologies to contribute uh, to global and locally Sustainable, the Sustainable Development Goals. One program that WALG is very proud to integrate, invited by Zoo Marine, uh, is Together We Protect, uh, where in our campi, and special outside, but in our campi, it's also a, a small area uh, that has been uh, uh, recovered uh, with the help of this uh, program. Um, several uh, thousands of native species are planted in burned areas by fires, or uh, several tons of plastic are collected from our coast wind volunteers. Uh, I wish you all a very fruitful days with sharing knowledge and inspiring, inspiring stories of conservation and education for sustainability. Enjoy the Congress, enjoy uh, our region, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's obvious that here in this amazing place, there's a very uh, nice constellation of uh, unique sense uh, entertaining, supported by the science. And of course, it must only happen or can only happen if there's a backing from the municipality and the community. So such as uh, I would like to invite the mayor of Albufeira, Jose Carlos Rolo, uh, invited to the pulpit. Need this. Mr. Andrew Papp, President of EASA, European Association uh, Zoo and Aquaria, uh, Miss, Mr. Pedro Lavia at home with COVID, Mr. Tiago Pierotti, Administrator of uh, Zoo Marine. Uh, Mr. Alexandre Teodosio, Vice Rector of University of Algarve, uh, Ms. My Fanny Griffiths, CEO uh, of uh, EAS. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. Welcome.
to these conference parks con uh, uh, annual annual conference uh, uh, at uh, Albufeira. Uh, I am grateful for the invitation, which I am very honoured addressed by the Zoomerin administration to be present at uh, this uh, open session in front of such distinguished participants. I greet in the, and welcome all participants in this, this conference. It is with great satisfaction and pride that we welcome you. I am sure that uh, you will give your time as used not only for everything you will learn during the work, but also to the surroundings, both in terms of the natural beauty of this municipality of Alpeira, and also to enjoy and taste a gastronomy of excellent quality and of high level. I congratulate the Zomarines administration for organiz organizing this meeting in Albufeira, once again contributing to Albufeira being on the map of what is best done in Europe and the world. On behalf of the municipality of Albufeira, I also want a word of enormous appreciation, recognition and even gratitude for the work carried at over 31 years, not only for the entertainment they provide to all users, but essential for the ambiental education activities, for the fight for biodiversity and for the constant commitment in favor of a more sustainable planet in which biodiversity is a fact of paramount importance. In the defense of uh, environment heritage and the uh, natural conversation, conservation, uh, the entire Zoomarine organization from its administrators, directors and employees has had an extra, extraordinary performance. Here I registered some aspects that have become known, such as, as cleaning the beach with educational and uh, our nest raising actions. Reforestation of the Algarve with 80,000 trees planted. Another aspect of enormous importance is the treatment of animals in difficult and accidents. To conclude, I would like to mention here the names of two great figures of this organization and that we are using using to sing in the performance of the most varied activities that are each one in their area. Uh, Mr. Pedro Lavia, uh, founder of this, uh, this park, uh, that from the most diverse of administration that I saw one day at uh, the beginning of the day to organize traffic in the park to facilitate its users and in another area, scientific and educational, my great friend, Dr. Elio Vicente. Uh, together, we protect. It's uh, some words proffered to Elio Vicente. Good morning, and uh, thank you for your, your uh, uh, coming to Albufeira. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the president and thank you for the board members. Thank you for all the staff who are assisting them in organizing this conference. It's a great honor for us to be here and a great honor to be part of your dream. So thank you again. Um, as we are over the introduction of the host, um, 
I would like to continue with some introduction. I don't know if there are first time attendees uh, in this room. May I ask them to stand up and just let us give them a warm welcome. Can you please stand up, first time attendees? And feel yourself welcome. Yes, it's indeed really nice to meet you. That's for us. Um, and yes, if, if I may introduce myself, just because that's a privilege for me to uh, speak uh, here in this, uh, to this audience for the first time on this occasion. My name is Andra Pop. I'm from Sosto Zoo, Hungary, where I'm a vice director. I have the mindset of a veterinarian, so that's how I approach the zoo-related problems. But I had the privilege to work with the ASA for almost 10 years. Positions like membership and, eth membership and ethics committee chairs, uh, secretary, vice chair. So that's how I got to the position of the chairmanship. And as a chair, I'm intended to intensify the communication and uh, inspire for more participation and the more representation in all over the association. Actually, this work has been done with great success and initiated in the uh, previous two terms uh, by a previous chair. And uh, so I just try to make the next step and uh, I want to really inspire uh, getting involved. So, I just want to inspire the smaller zoos and all those who hasn't yet been really represented or didn't find a way to be represented, just to inspire them to speak up and then seeking ways and then uh, finding ways to let their voice to be heard. And as such, uh, I would like to praise the, the work of the, of the last president since obviously we, had, we needed a leader for the next uh, or the previous uh, two terms. That was Thomas Kaufhaus. Thomas, if I may invite you to the stage. Thank you very much. Thomas was the president for six years. He really established and uh, renewed the venues for everyone to be represented in this association. He has done his uh, work with great success and uh, showed us an example how to tackle problems, how to solve problems. And you can believe me, there were a lot of puzzles and a lot of problems to solve. And since I know that Thomas will find new challenges, uh, not in the association, but otherwise in his life, uh, I wish you, Thomas, that you enjoy your time in the future uh, without these hassles, uh, at least as much as we were enjoying your work uh, for six years. And as a small appreciation of the tokens, we are really grateful for those one who responded or called for fundraiser and helped Thomas to reach this point in his life. It's not too much, but uh, we probably find a way for you just to do nothing and find a destination anywhere in the world with closure and enjoy your time with your uh, beloved wife, Suzanne. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm. Now I would uh, continue with the main topic. It's very short, really, of my speech. It is just to say that we are here to celebrate. And we can really ce celebrate many things. I, I, could, I could make a list of, of many items, but I do only want to uh, highlight two items. So the first, or achievement, we have this nicely represented book of the ASA. It's a great 
very nice summary of our work, especially for the external stakeholders. Uh, you will receive one sample of, of this book, everyone. Um, and uh, the second, which you can find on the ASA website, is the committee reports. It's really a proof of a nice work or enthusiastic work all over the years. And uh, you are part of that work. So every member, every committee, every chair, and everyone, and not, uh, last but not least, every staff of the EEO is part of this work. And I'm here to thank you for this work. Thank you for the commitment and congratulations for it. The second why we can celebrate is very simple, is the reconnecting. So after so many years working only online, it's really great and I don't want to do, uh, uh, tell it why, I just see the excitement in your eyes. It's so nice to have interactions, real interactions from the colleagues. Uh, we had great achievements uh, in the past years. We launched a very massive strategy for the coming years. We started to implement the RCP planning. Those are two excellent examples which will be, of course, discussed in this meeting in details. But we are missing the fine tuning and we are missing the real feedbacks if this is a good plan or we need to adjust it or shape it so that everyone finds in himself in it. And if it fits for everyone, that will be really a viable way to uh, go further. So I would like to encourage you to find a way for the communication, seek the way everywhere in every topic, you must give any feedback, some, some of yourself. And you can do it in the sessions, in the, in the workshops, in the open sessions, uh, everywhere in the coffee breaks. I just encourage you to uh, attend the, the exhibitors space as well because they are working with us and they, they are working, uh, working for us. And you have a nice application as well. You can check all the programs. You can, you can chat as well, whatever you want. But I encourage you to the in-person communication since that's why we are here. And also, if we are talking about the nuances, the diversity which we can add to this community, and this is a real value, and that, that's what uh, makes us uh, strong. As a closing of my speech, let, let me add some personal bits. Uh, back in the time when I, when I started to work here, uh, I, I just was amazed of the professionalism of the colleagues. And I, I thought that, that the best way I can, I can add something to this community is just the decent manner and, and uh, showing up my professionalism. But uh, this year, when I'm talking so much about the diversity, I thought that uh, probably I should give a twist in my presence and, and I would be more authentic if I, if I showed something for myself. So just let me show you. It's brand new. It's, it's not, not, not a used socks, but I, I just uh, bought some set of colorful socks. And this is the way how I would like to demonstrate that you shouldn't be shy to show up yourself and, and be different a bit and, uh, and give something from you which is unique. But what I would like to ask in this conference to do it with, with patience and with utmost respect towards each other's feelings and personal space. And with these closing words, I would like to hand over uh, to our next speaker, Edith Corum who is an executive coach and coaching supervisor, journalist, and an expert in the inter-country and intercultural communication. Please welcome her on the stage. Cool. Okay, well, there is no doubt that you know an awful lot about animals, so much so that probably many of you could be on this stage instead of me and lecture about it. What I'd like us to focus on is us as a human species, how to look at how our human interaction, how we behave with each other, can have an impact on the animals who are in our care. And additionally, I'd like to introduce you to the fact that lots of this behavior are actually culturally rooted. And it's something we don't really think much about it. So 
let's, um, I'm going to take you through a journey for a few minutes, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes. Try to introduce you to this approach of what this intercultural piece, if I can call it like that, how does it come into play in the way we are with each other? So, to start, we will uh, go through a little detour through the world you know so well, the world of animals. But with a little difference in the sense that we're going to look at how we perceive these animals. So I'll take you through a little video that was put together by a Spanish blogger um, who calls himself Alan. And it's part of his podcast called Alan's Theory. Whatever the theory is, I have no idea. But I thought the video was quite charming. So let's have a look at this video. Okay, <laughs> so we can go on, right? We had the pigs, we had, you know, lots of them. It's enough. So clearly a rooster is a rooster in Germany or in Korea. A dog is a dog in Portugal or in uh, Estonia, clearly. But what is interesting is um, what this video shows us is these animals sound differently? Well, no, obviously not. They sound what they sound like. But we perceive their sounds differently. So how is that? It's quite interesting because finally you observe that our languages operate as filters. You might know that some languages have sounds others do not have. Um, so that's the first point. The second is that languages are part, it's a code that we share in, in a social group. And it's our collective representation that has built through cultural transmission that tells us what the animal sounds like. For example, I was brought up in French. And for me, clearly, a rooster sounds, the French people here, thank you. My husband brought up in English. For him, clearly, a rooster sounds, the English speakers, thank you. So, um, we take our collective representation of the animal sounds basically for granted until we are exposed to other languages, for example. Um, but even though subconsciously our familiar filters of representations, they still prevail. Let me give you one personal example. Um, my husband, English husband, yeah, yeah, the same one, you know. Uh, when he was a child, he was feeling terribly sorry for the other foreign children, for foreign children, because he thought in his child's mind that foreign children had to learn English first in order to name things and then translate it into their own language. I mean, it's, it's naive and quite charming, uh, but it is a classical uh, trait of what we call in social anthropology, ethnocentrism. That is, you put your culture at the center and that tint filters what you see or experience. So, my husband has moved on. He has learned how to name things in five other languages. 
but he still gets his genders wrong in French. So, we'll stay with the animals a bit longer. And uh, we'll go a step further, even deeper, and to tackle what is known as cultural relativism. You see on, uh, on this slide there, you have a representation of Athena. Athena in ancient Greece was the goddess of wisdom. And she's often represented by an owl, or she symbolized herself as an owl. Um, and in most Western countries, the owl has come to represent wisdom. But in Netherlands, I'm told, the, 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 the owl is a symbol of being uncooperative, stubborn, and inflexible. There is even a Dutch saying that goes, what difference does it make? What difference do light and glasses make if the owl does not want to see? In India, the owl stare is considered as dopey. You know, this, right? Rather than penetrating, leading to its reputation as a dimwit, and so much so that I'm told that in Hindi, a language I do not speak, right? Uh, that the word uru, if it's pronounced like that, can mean an idiot or a fool. Okay, I take another example, the last one, the tortoise. So, the, um, you're familiar probably with the, 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 the fable of the hare and the tortoise by Aesopi, the Greek uh, fabulist or the French version written by the 17th century French writer Jean de La Fontaine, uh, who translated, plagiarized a little bit, is okay. Um, and uh, through them, we learn that the tortoise is slow. Remember, she's racing with the hare, is racing with her. Uh, but it's persistent. And this is, you know, this is a trait. This is something, a model to be emulated. Hmm. But uh, in China, particularly for the Taoist philosophy, the tortoise represents the universe. The boom uh, shell of the tortoise is the heavens, and the flat bottom is the earth. And the tortoise is the heroine, the hero, of many, many legends in China. But in Thailand, in Asia still, right? In Thailand, the tortoise is associated with something very different. Let's have a look at this video. You'll see what it is. Chinese team force roll on. Lang ring up green guy. Man jai. Right green nan. Okay. So, you just learned that in Thai, the slang for body odor is turtles. The Thai word for turtles. Okay. All right. Um, so, the perfume company that played, you know, used this play with words in this ad is quite clever, I must say, and unexpected. So all these examples, and there would be plenty more, obviously, uh, ref indicate, reflect, illustrate what I call, we call cultural relativism. That is, what we take for granted in one cultural environment does not systematically apply to another. Uh, 
And uh, the simplest example, have you ever tried to translate a joke? Most of the time it falls flat, not because you're bad translators, it's just because the sets of cultural refer references that are implied in the joke don't work across language languages very often. So, uh, this video also gives us a hint, which is quite interesting, about what constitutes culture. We all were, you know, teary eyed, seeing the little turtles feeling lonely and crying. And then we all, you know, our hearts were reassured when we saw that she had found, you know, she ran to the woman, you know, thinking that uh, he, she, how do you recognize whether a turtle is he or she? I don't know. Uh, had found a mate. She had reacquainted re through the odor with something that was familiar. She had re-entered what I call, what we call, a familiar circle of belonging, which we all operated. So keep, keep that in mind. We'll, I'll go back to that later. I think it's high time to define culture. Um, okay, the little bee there, the first one says, is it cultural? The other one says, it's natural, and the guys are fighting. Because, why I put that there? Because I think it's kind of a cute illustration of what, uh, uh, what happened for a very long time. Culture was really the theme of reflection for philosophers. And, uh, and they saw culture as the prerogative of human, and that was a dis famous distinction between nature and culture. Well, these boundaries are now being stretched to accepting that animals might have some use tools, some others might have languages. Since I'm totally ignorant about it, and you are, many of you are specialists, I'm going to not step onto this territory. I'm going to stay within the one I know better, human. Uh, but basically, it is interesting because the, the philosophers, start, going back to them briefly, they started thinking about the concept of identity, the concept of otherness, um, and this kind of move to the field of uh, more recent field of social anthropology, which is basically what a lot of what I'm talking about is based upon in terms of theory. Um, so, so from this perspective, I start with the official definition of culture that was given by the uh, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural uh, Organization in 2001, and it tells us that culture is a set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features of a society or a social group that encompasses not only art and literature, it's not culture with a big C, it's also this culture with a little C, which is lifestyles, ways of living together, value systems, traditions, beliefs, etc. Um, so, interesting. To, to know that, you know, all this is uh, defined. Uh, what maybe we need to go into very briefly, and I don't want to bore you with lots of heavy stuff, but what is interesting to, to, to keep in mind is that culture is learned. It's not, uh, um, it is learned, shared, symbolic, integrated, dynamic. So it's learned. Learn meaning what? It's not inherited, it's not innate. It's not a reflex, right? It's, uh, it's something you learn through experience, being the family, being at school, being, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It is also shared. It's something we share uh, in terms of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a group. And um, one individual's actions do not constitute culture. It's your personality trait, but it's not culture. Um, it is symbolic. We just saw it with the owl, for example, or the tortoise. Uh, this symbols are shared and understood by a given group. And it is integrated. In, what does it mean integrated? It means that there are various elements, you know, the, the connected elements. That is the very complexity of culture. Com culture with a little c, again, is not something simple. And it is dynamic. In other words, it adapts and it changes uh, with time. So, one little, uh, little precision here. 
Culture is not universal to a social group. They're always what we call deviants in sociology. They're people who are marginals, who are stepping outsiders, uh, who are not inside, you know. And it doesn't mean a harmonious group always. Not everybody speaks with the same word, uh, 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 words in one given social group. But anyhow, um, so let me give you perhaps a shorter version, uh, definition, which is and one you'll easily remember eventually, is the collective programming of the mind that, distinguishing, that distinguishes a member of one group or category of people from another. This definition was given by a fellow called Gerd Hofstede, a Dutch uh, um, gentleman who was um, a researcher on culture, and I go back to that in a minute, and he was one of the early theorists of the intercultural field. And, uh, and the intercultural field, as you've understood by now, stems from social anthropology. So he wrote this, but I will give you maybe even an easier definition. Our brain is the hardware, culture, software. This one is an easy one, right? Um, so, oops, sorry. Boop. Voilà. Um, so one interesting element to, to, to keep in mind is that this field has been researched quite a bit. In, um, in the last 60 years, probably, at least, in social anthropology and more. And one gentleman, I just want to give you his name and maybe recommend his book because it is still of such fantastic actuality, of relevance. It's uh, Edward T. Hall, who wrote back in 1959, 60 years ago, a beautiful book called The Silent Language. And he is a kind of the founder, the pioneer of intercultural communication. Anyhow, uh, what we've seen with the acceleration of globalized economic exchanges, pe people moving around the world much more, um, we've seen an acceleration of the research of, in this field as well. And by now, all this stuff I'm talking about is taught in universities, you have degrees in it, countless books are written, uh, and Countless workshops are organized in corporate world, and I work in lots of this, actually, particularly when I was in China. Uh, and, um, and I'm talking to you about it today, right? So it is of relevance still today. So um, people have built on the original work by Hall. This fellow, Hofstede, conducted his initial research in the 70s within the IBM, that was IBM company that was expanding at the time. You have really interesting people like Hampton Perner, uh, a philosopher of management from Britain, and his partner, Franz Trompenaus, another Dutch gentleman, uh, who have done interesting research on and on and on. Uh, but, you know, I won't go through all the list. I just want to, um, to say that this is a very rich field nowadays. Uh, the specialists still debate whether culture should be represented as an iceberg with only its emerged part visible, as an onion with lots of layers, or as a tree with, you know, deep roots and the fruit hanging. Well, we won't go into, you know, decide, you can choose, you know, which metaphor you want to go with. But um, what I find is that we, we can debate about the, the metaphors, but we observe it uh, in our own countries, in our own companies, organizations, associations, like you here, how we struggle to see, value, and hence uh, a shared culture. How we fall back into the us-them dichotomy. How we embrace stereotypes and how we point fingers at others, or as the Bible say, you know, you see the moat in the other's eye, but not the beam in your own eye. So I'd like to share with you uh, one quote from Edward T. Hall, which I believe is key. He wrote back, back then, um, culture hides more than it reveals. And strangely enough, it what it hides it hides most effectively to its own participants. In other words, it's very difficult to be aware of your own cultural makeup. It's like the fish, right? The fish in, uh, 
in um, in his little fishbowl. It's only when you take him out, you know, of his fishbowl that he's going to realize that he's missing the water in which he was. Uh, it's a bit like that for us. So, Hall, what does he say? He says that the first piece, the first building block in navigating these com complex intercultural waters is developing your self-awareness. Because there might be some misunderstanding there. So, uh, so the, what I'd like you to do from now on, from all these concepts, I'm going to develop a few more. Um, I'd like you to apply this principle of self-awareness to yourself. And that is to step back and reflect and ask yourself um, where you stand. Uh, how do you behave? What are your cultural triggers? How do you define your cultural circles of belonging? Why, when do you think us? When do you say them? Right? So, we look at this diagram briefly. We don't have to understand everything right away, but it goes basically in concentric circles, looking at personality, kind of what they call internal dimensions, you know, of uh, your age. We know that there are cultural differences between age groups, right? They are even defined, the millennials, the generation Z, the Z, you know, all this stuff. And people of my age, you know, the baby boomers. Uh, race, ethnicity, etc. Then we have the external, you know, whether you are urban, rural, whether you have an educational background, etc., etc., whether you're married or not. What I'd like you to pay attention to, because it's perhaps of more relevance, is the external circle, which is the organizational dimension called here, which have to do with the, your field of specialty, the, the unit you work in, how senior you are, your work location, etc., etc. Because this is really interesting for us, because not only it gives us some clues about what could be your cultural, some of elements of your cultural makeup, but also it can tell us where you draw boundaries, where you feel comfortable. You know, obviously veterinarians, and don't take offense, veterinarians in this group here, can talk about veterinarian topics that they wouldn't be able to talk about with me, right? Uh, so, communication is obviously easier in familiar circles. So, and, but beyond the differences, it will help you identify what you have in common. So, to apply, and the last piece, you know, of, uh, of framing, basically, all this, is looking at what is called, in the intercultural field, the cultural dimension. Because to kind of, uh, to apply this piece of self-awareness, Right, where, where am I? Which is, I just ask you to do. It's uh, important to have some elements, some signposts that will help us uh, find our way through it. And that has been defined by all these intercultural specialists I talked about. And I have chosen to share with you probably the most recent one done by a woman called Erin Meyer, an American who lives in Paris. She's a former colleague of mine. But, and she teaches at the business school in Seattle now, in, uh, in, um, near, Far near Paris. But she didn't re and reinvent the wheel, but it's updated, basically. So it's, uh, it's interesting. And what we, she looks at eight criteria or eight uh, behavior that we need to use. And if we look specifically at the professional world, in our business interactions, in our professional interactions, right? Uh, the communicating, evaluating, persuading, uh, leading, deciding, trusting, disagreeing, sh scheduling, etc. So, if you allow me, I will go through them briefly, one by one, to, and try to, to, to give you examples of what it means. So, let's look at uh, the communicating. Uh, ask yourself, when I write an email, a message, uh, is the message in the words I use? Do people have to read between the lines? Or what I don't say is actually more important than when I, what I say? Hmm. Uh, this is the polarity that is illustrated there of high, low context. Low context, the message is in the words. Right? So, 
uh, it can vary, of course, depending on, on, on the context in which you operate. The evaluating, that is kind of self-explanatory. You know, it's, you give direct feedback or indirect feedback. And, but let me give you one example how it can be very confusing when you change cultural environment or you're dealing with somebody who comes from a different background. This is sort of a French woman I know, um, and as a edu French educated woman, she was used to quite blunt feedback because in French, in France and French culture, and the French don't take offense, uh, I'm French so I can say it, um, we tend to see things quite negatively, right? The negative tends to prevail over the positive. There it is. Um, so this woman moves to California, works for an IT company, and she goes to meet her manager, and she gets a usual American hamburger, like the hamburgers we had last night by the pool, feedback, i.e. one positive, one negative in the middle, one positive, okay? What does she hear? She comes out of the meeting thrilled, so happy to have been praised. Well, actually, she completely missed the point. What her manager wanted to tell her, wanted to highlight, was the negative in the middle, which she didn't hear, right? So, obviously, the manager needs to adapt as well and understand where she comes from and vice versa. But it gives you a, a, a very simple and, uh, example of, uh, of a very stupid honestly, misunderstanding, that can have, can have consequences. So, where are you? How do you give feedback? How do you receive feedback for this matter? It's not only how you give it, how do you receive it? The um, third one, the persuading. Hmm, that's a tough one. Whether rules prevail, principles, or whether a pragmatic application should be favored. This is a tension which I see all the time, and I work for large multinational companies between the headquarters, headquarter, uh, headquarters and the local subsidiaries, between you know, the corporate, the whatever, the, uh, and, and uh, the, the, the country uh, residents. Um, so I've, hear, I've heard so many times, you know, global does not understand us, and I heard Conversely, from headquarters, well, the local subsidiaries, you know, the, the locals don't apply the rules, basically, don't follow the procedures. So what is your own style? Are you going to be really clinging to rules and procedures? Are you going to be more pragmatic, uh, i.e. looking for applications first? Ask yourself. Then there is the leading. Leading often is often a clear cultural divider there. Uh, because you can have either national, organizational uh, cultures that weigh very heavily uh, on this aspect. And, of course, hierarchies exist in all organizations, in all countries, in all setups, naturally. Uh, but it can be displayed in a very, very crude way. Uh, I have seen parking lots with uh, parking spots reserved for the high-level executives. I have seen buildings with a reserved lift for the CEO only. I mean, that tells you about hierarchy, does it? But um, um, what do we see nowadays? I don't know how many of you have been inflicted this thing. The hot desk policy, do you know what it is? Well, it means that you don't have a desk. You don't have an office. You arrive with your laptop because everything is in the laptop. On purpose, there are not even desks for, in, enough desks for all the people coming to work in this office. And they basically have to fight for a desk to, on which to put their laptop. I, I mean, it is quite something. I mean, COVID and remote work has eased that a little bit, but that was something very interesting. So, but that means, and that applies to everybody across the board, to the even to the executive committee, uh, executive team, right? So, the deciding, how do we decide? Is it my way or the highway? Or is time spent building consensus, which is with all the relevant stakeholders? How is it done around you? Trusting, 
Trust is a very complicated factor. Very. We can spend hours discussing it. Uh, we know when we have destroyed, damaged trust, it's much more difficult at times to, to figure out how to build it. But let me give you a few uh, clues there. Trust can be task-based or relationship-based. What does it mean? Task-based, it means what you're going to be, trust is going to be developed by how well you do things, what you do, and how well you do it. Oh, uh, and another, uh, the, the other side of the continuum, it's through building relationship. It doesn't mean that you don't get the job done, but it's going to go through the relationship building, right? And some cultures have a trust deficit. You don't start at zero, giving you the benefit of the doubt. You start at minus. So imagine, right? Climb back to trust level. And others, has, it's just based on, you're given, you know, I give you my trust because you know somebody I know. Very simply. Okay. So the disagreeing, hmm, do we confront issues or do we let it go uh, because we don't like conflict? This, what is your own style? How are you with this? And it becomes even more complicated if you bring into that the ingredient of hier hierarchy. Whom do you dare disagree with? Right? And the scheduling in the last one here, uh, is time seen, uh, sorry, as sequential, um, as um, linear, or is it flexible? Uh, it has to do with respecting deadlines, with being on time at meetings, or allowing other priorities to interfere. This one is a tricky one as well because that can be also impacting trust. How you treated, how you handle time might be really seen as either trust builder or trust destroyer uh, for, from others. Okay, enough about this. But. Uh, all these dimensions, what do they do? It's kind of, as I said, it's signposting. It helps us, you know, uh, bring to consciousness and put into concrete words what otherwise remains a little bit fuzzy. Uh, I have also too often heard uh, as an excuse for not addressing issues, oh, well, that's cultural. But once you've said that, you've said nothing, right? You, don't ha you haven't found a way to solve it. Um, so... What uh, we need to do when we work in a complex uh, cultural environment is to develop what is called the intercultural competence. Uh, and it's defined by Milton Bennett and Hammer there as simply the capacity to shift cultural perspective and appropriately uh, adapt behavior to cultural differences and commonalities. And they, they look at what I find interesting. It has three, three aspects which are quite rich. Mindset, you know, your intercultural awareness, self-awareness. How does it matter? How important is it? Your intercultural sensitivity, meaning um, your emotional desire. It's not only intellectual, it's your emotional desire to, yeah, to be closer to others, to understand, to appreciate other cultural differences. And the skill set, uh, which is <coughs> how adroit you are at um, navigating these waters, and particularly uh, having to do with how you communicate. Because at the end of the day, most of this is going to be showing in the way you communicate with each other. So... Um, it's tough to say, but life is uh, unfair. We are not gifted with the same level of intercultural competence. Some of us have a very high level of it. Others, some of us, don't have it. And for obvious reasons, if you've always lived in the same environment, you know, why you should be motivated, encouraged, you know, to operate across cultures, right? Uh, so... The, these people, Bennett, who was one of my professors, actually, um, has um, developed a model, 
which I show you very briefly because I, I, I think it's, we have enough. Ah. Okay, I don't know how well you can read it, but um, so you have the denial, and I like it, I keep it because it has, you know, fish, right? Okay, so uh, the denial, I, you know, I, um, I don't uh, consider that cultural differences exist at all. The defense, you know, my culture is better than the others. The minimization, yeah, okay, the cultural dif differences, but what? Uh, the acceptance, oh yeah, there are different cultural perceptions. And adaptations, I adapt my behavior, my reasoning, you know, to, to, uh, to, this, to the new culture, to, to the encounter, and the integration, and this is, and there are quite a few people like that nowadays, right? Because the world has allowed uh, quite a lot of generations to move around different cultures and find their bearings in it. It's the integration, where different aspects of yourself are going to be um, coming into play uh, in different circumstances. Okay, so that's all the theory, right? You still with me? Thank you. Uh, we're going to go on to Yaza fictional case studies. Real stories. <gasps> no, they're not real. No, don't, don't, don't worry. They're fictional. And David uh, Mitchell very kindly provided them. But David and I are very clear. That's not an exercise that's finger pointing and making people uncomfortable. They're really here to bring to our own world, to your world, all this stuff I've been talking about. Um, and they are fictional. Nevertheless, they might sound familiar. Hmm? Okay, so I put this slide back because you're going to see that we're going to, these dimensions, they're going to come into play. So I'm going to tell you a few stories and how are we on time? Do I have time to have people having a bit of interaction? How much more time do I have? Five, ten minutes? Okay, great, good. So, first story. Um, it's a transfer of a bull African elephant from a municipal zoo in Hungary. That's not your zoo, okay? It doesn't, it's not systematically your zoo. It's a fictional zoo. <laughs> to a zoo in Spain. Uh, the zoo in Hungary has recently joined Yaza, and it's one of their first transfers they asked to make. Uh, the animal in question is a new addition to the EEP uh, population and has, I'm told, a quite interesting genetic uh, profile that could very much help the program uh, stay sustainable. Okay, familiar so far? For the local government that owns the Hungarian zoo, the elephant is a major selling point for the zoo, and they have used the image and the name on their advertising for a decade, 10 years. Uh, all the merchant, lots of the merchandising produced and the educators use it, etc. And, uh, and it reached the point that the municipality has basically built its image around this elephant and the mayor has used it massively in his re-election campaign. Hmm. Um, so, if uh, moving this elephant to Spain sounds to them like commercial suicide, right? And a uh, major blow to the institution. Well, uh, so to the zoo, the recommendation to move the elephant, no, is not uh, possible. Uh, but because of the EP rules, um, as you know, the recommendation is mandatory. So the EP coordinator is very surprised when the zoo tells him, mm -mm, elephant's not leaving, elephant is staying. Okay. So what is the challenge? Let's try to step back. Okay. You know that EP can make, you know, uh, a case for not transferring uh, such animals, but if the animal is of particular importance uh, to the program, 
uh, and to the population, it will be, uh, there will be pressure. Uh, so how do we get both sides to agree to something and move to a solution that could be satisfying to both? So, some intercultural clues. All the stuff you know about the image, the merchandising of the elephant, the importance it has, the symbol of the, the town, the use the mayor made it, use, did it uh, for his re-election campaign. All that, the EP coordinator has no idea. He doesn't know. He was never told. This is very high context, what I've been sharing with you. And the other guy is, um, is a German scientist and very direct in his communication. He sees the scientific value of transferring this elephant. He's direct in his communication, low context. Um, so um, he doesn't have the local context. And uh, so what do we suggest? I give you an answer for this one. I let you work on the next one. Uh, we suggest that uh, the, to engage in a conversation with the mayor, because he's really the authority ultimately, and uh, if he's willing to talk and praise his contribution and basically um, flatter him about you know how he's been working for animal preservation, uh, conservation, and. Tell him, you can tell this story, you can even tell, tell the world that you're the one who made this transfer possible and you are contributing to elephant preservation. Uh, that's a good story to say. And if the mayor refuses, the EP can always find another elephant. Okay? So that was the first one. And it had to do with communication. But you see the missing, the subtext, right? The second one has to do with evaluating. It's a British EP uh, coordinator for Tiger who speaks with a French zoo animal manager. Uh, the French zoo has announced the birth of a white tiger. As you certainly know, white tigers are very inbred and healthy, not very interesting uh, for conservation. And as such, as that does not encourage, mm, allow actually members to breed white tigers deliberately, uh, but it is recognized that you know, animals can mate and they can, you know, uh, breed by accident. Uh, back to our story. Um, the British EP coordinator is furious. And he writes a letter, a strong letter to the French uh, zoo animal manager. And he says, and pay attention to the words, pay attention to the words. It's very unfortunate that this has happened and the manager, he said, he adds, should think carefully about how he manages the animals in his care. The manager agrees. And in his own words, the manager says, I will think carefully about the management, about the animals, uh, the white tigers in my care. Okay? Two years later, guess what? Another white tiger. Okay. At the zoo. <laughs> and this time, okay. So we pause for a moment. Very unfortunate, um, thinking very carefully. Uh, these are words which are very indirect and actually they're typical of British language, British English, understatement. What it actually means, it's the opposite. It's a, it's a serious problem. Never do it again. <laughs> right? So, you need to have the subtitles, the cultural subtitles, to get it. Remember, I'm married to an Englishman. Yes, the same one. Uh, 35 years. I still need subtitles when he speaks like that. Uh, okay, so what about the French guy? The French uh, zoo um, uh, animal manager. When he said, I will think carefully, je... Euh, ça veut dire en français, mais je, je vais faire attention. Hein? Je vais faire attention. Well, it doesn't mean commitment. It's just an intention. Right? So, um, you have the root of the misunderstanding just there in the words. Right? Um, so, 
the, 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 the cub is uh, born. And um, so the EP coordinator is absolutely furious. Uh, she thought she was very clear, et cetera, et cetera. Now, imagine the level of trust between these two people. Minus. So how do we resolve this? Sorry. Kill the right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, what happened there is, you know, uh, probably no nice resolution there because, well, there are rules, you know. Uh, it's, the motivation is very unclear. Was it done on purpose? Because it's, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. But what happened eventually? Well, yes, I was going to say, you know, um, the, the French Jew is going to be uh, reprimanded, right, in this case. Okay, let's move to a case and I leave you to talk because I think we, we have very quickly. Uh, we move to China. China is dear to me. I lived there for 10 years. That's where I met David Mitchell. Um, um, so, we're back uh, we, in the, the uh, Republic, uh, People's Republic of China, and we are in a field conservation project, um, which is worth keen to restore the habitats of the rare species of pika. And thank you, I had to look, Google it. I discovered what it is. Now I know something. Uh, the local municipality is in co involved in this project, naturally, because all the right stakeholders have to be involved as uh, this uh, IUCN, one plan approach uh, requires. So I'm being very low context here, you see, even for those of you who know, right? Um, it's an approach to conservation that says that everyone who will be affected should be involved. Uh, and then it has a much higher chance of success. So the zoo team is looking uh, for consensus across the board to make sure that the project works. Um, and that there are no conflicts with the local herders. But the local government has announced that it will remove all the herders and, um, from the areas and make the reserve completely inaccessible to their animals, despite the fact that their animals have been grazing on it, on, the, on this land. So the zoo understands the, the international implication in the sense that they're going to be, you know, the object of criticism from a civil, uh, from a, Society, civil society groups in, back in Europe particularly, if they allow uh, this decision to go ahead. And uh, they need to find a way to persuade the local government, uh, the governor, uh, about this. So, what is at play here? Think about it for a moment. Yeah, okay. What is at play is hierarchy, the consensus and top-down, and the egalitarian hierarchical. As you might have observed with the way uh, COVID, the zero COVID, COVID policy was implemented in China, it's a rather top-down way of doing things, right? You've observed that. Uh, and that applies at all levels of society, including in your world. Um, so, the consensus, decision-making versus, you know, the stop-down, and the um, power of the hierarchy are going to be overwhelming. So what we recommend here is probably very simply to take this local government that the, the, the conservation manager takes this governor aside uh, very privately and try to persuade him uh, that is going same to reflect well, you know, on the preservation, etc. It has a matter of what kind of space the local government has himself. And I had a very quick one. Do I still have time to go for this one? No. So I don't want. I don't want to go. This one. It had to do with scheduling. But I will just um, leave you with a few uh, recommendations. Um, so I. 
just to recap a little bit about with a few things I've said. Um, this is just the beginning of an exploration, right? And it's, it takes a while to think in these terms, but it certainly proves useful, particularly working in such an inter international environment. And some of the concepts are, you know, the beware of ethnocentrism, you know, explore cultural relativism, all this stuff I talked about, but more importantly, be self-aware and identify your circles of belongings when you see them, us. Uh, and very concrete, very concrete recommendations, very applicable. The four pillars of successful intercultural teams are those, uh, which is the overcome uh, the cultural, the communication barriers, I e use explicit communication. There's a bit of a typo here, overcome communication barriers. Uh, what I said earlier on, use explicit, clear communication. Don't let people guess. Build a behavior, behavior uh, trust-based behavior. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Really ask yourself, is my behavior contributing to building trust or the other way around? Uh, remind each other what you're doing together. Just reminding each other of a common purpose is of great help. And spend time with each other. So, a lot of it was taking place yesterday. Uh, more will take place in, the, in this coming four days. And uh, remember, when you hear a, co a, a rooster, ask yourself what it sounds. Cocorico or crocodile do? Thank you. Thank you very much, Edith. Those were really relevant thoughts, uh, thoughts that are worth to taste and taste again and digest all over the week, all of us. And it reminds me, uh, not always think with my professional mind, but sometimes stop and think out of the box. Unfortunately, we have to move along and now back to the achievements and uh, some numbers to prove it. I would like to invite Cassandra uh, Griffith, the uh, CEO of the ASA, to talk, tell us about the last year. Super. Well, I am so, so happy to be back here. As you all know, when I get excited, I do tend to talk a little bit fast, and I'm aware because of Edith's beautiful presentation, we have to manage our time flexibly. But I'm going to have to try and speak slowly, but pack a lot in the next few minutes, because boy, have you all packed a lot in in the last year. It's definitely my privilege to present these updates on the EASA activities, but very much it represents the work of our community, our EASA culture. Definitely, I have a lot of things going through my head after the presentations you've already seen today. So when we talk about um, IASA, our culture and our people, and as Andre said, I do like my numbers. And usually this is where I would finish my presentation on our how many people do we have at conference. But at our wonderful icebreaker last night, so many people came up to me to say, oh, we've got over 900 people, how much over 900 people is it, etc. And so I'm delighted to say that we have beat all of our previous conference records. 119 participants, 102 institutions across 71 countries. And considering we have IASA members in 48 countries, to get sort of, you know, nearly double that in representation here today is just a fantastic testament to the work that we're doing, to our desire to be together, to learn together and to grow together. So thank you all for attending. And I really do very much love these numbers. And as I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it is all of you, it is all of us. I'm really double thinking my words now with them and us um, about doing this work. And that work is centered around our EASA strategy. And we've agreed our new vision of being progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you. And my presentation today is structured around the strategic pillars that are helping us achieve this vision together. And those five pillars are represented on the screen here, and I'll talk through the work in our different areas. 
When we look back at our strategy, we had just entered it from 21 to 2025, and we look at the progress that we made in our very first year. And indeed, you know, kind of coming out of COVID, but there was still quite a lot going on in 2021. We can see we managed to achieve some of the things we planned to do, an awful lot of orange in there because, of course, our targets are over that strategic five-year period. And a little bit of red really identifying those areas that COVID kind of stalled us on our progress. Or, as Andre was saying in his presentation, some fine-tuning needed. Maybe this element of the strategy wasn't quite right or it took more time to develop. We needed more input. And so again, just to represent that across those five focal pillars, you can see some good achievement across all of them, a little bit of areas we still need to work on. And definitely as we come into this year, we're continuing working on that strategy. And this time next year, we'll see much more green in there and hopefully much less red as well as we progress on. And in terms of the people that are doing the work, one of the other things that the sort of easing of COVID restrictions enabled us to do was to start our screenings again, to start assessing both new and existing members against our standards. So we were super excited and thankful to everybody that welcomed us into their institutions or acted as screeners as well. We do have some new members um, in terms of those joining IASA um, in those temporary member categories, temporary members under construction, some temporary members that have made full membership, so they've really um, uh, you know, made those improvements that we requested and are meeting our full standards, so we welcome them in, and indeed two new corporate members as well. And I'm aware that we have a backlog of new members waiting to join IASA which on the one hand I think is fantastic. It's great that we have more people wanting to join our community. But on the other hand, I'm going to have to ask those new members to be a little bit patient and understanding because what we really want to do is catch up with our IASA accreditation program. We had our cycle to get through screening all of our existing members and that's our priority for us. It was put on pause for the past two years, but boy, have we ramped up that process again. In the last 12 months, we've screened 24 existing members. As I said, that's been our priority. And we've got 14 screenings planned for the October to December period. So lots of IASA um, screeners and rapporteurs visiting you in your institution. And this has meant our new deadline for getting all of our existing members screened is by the end of uh, spring 2024. So we're looking to be on track to meet that target. And if you are one of those few members left that haven't been screened yet, please contact Bohari in the office and arrange your screening so we can help meet that target. So 74% of IASA members was where we were at this time last year. But with that massive amount of screenings, we're now up to 87%, looking to make it 100 by the beginning of 2024. And as we say, I like my numbers, so this is just a breakdown of where we sit at the moment. We are the largest regional um, zoo and aquarium association. We have more members than everybody else. And of course, that does mean we have a right range of different countries, cultures, and individual members. And I think Edith has given us lots to think about, about how we are effective and get the work done that we want to do with all of those differences, but making them, uh, working with them to make us stronger. And part of that work, of course, is in training and professional development. And the Academy has been going from strength to strength as we recover from COVID with a range of both in-person and online trainings. And you can see some amazing quotes from some of our participants there. I'm sure there are many people in the room here who joined us on some of the trainings in the last year and made up some of those participants and institutions. Looking forward, we have a range of different training events going on across all the different areas of our work, from conservation education to program management to um, um, in exhibit design, etc. You can see the range of different topics on the screen, and you can find out more about these courses online. Also, of course, the one thing, well, not just the only thing, but one of the many things COVID gave us was this opportunity to transition to doing more online work. And so we have a range of online and self-paced learning as well. Um, and again, across a range of topics from Canva, which is about communication skills and pre presenting on things a bit more jazzy than my PowerPoint, but also welfare webinars. And I'm super excited and very, very proud of all the work that's gone into creating the self-paced animal welfare assessment training module. Just watch our communications for the rollout of that. And this will be a great resource to help everybody learn about what animal welfare assessments are, how to carry them out, and that you can do in your own time and at any level within an organization. So congratulations to everybody involved in that, and we'll be excited to roll it out soon. Focusing in on that first focal area there, in terms of leading in zoo and aquarium animal management and care, I just wanted to pick up a few highlights of the amazing amount of work that's gone on in the past year. 
And one of those is our best practice guidelines. We're just adding to these continually all the time. And I'm so impressed with everybody who is doing all the great work to create these best practice guidelines and, of course, making them freely available. So we're not only supporting our ERs and membership in understanding and caring for animals that they look after, but also every other zoo aquarium or interested person out there. And you can really see the range of species here as well. And that just demonstrates the breadth of expertise that we have in our community. So congratulations to everybody involved in those. And we're even doing revisions and updates because as we know, nothing stays still within our world and we have to update on latest scientific advances as well. A large part of this focal area is around our population management planning. And that starts with our regional collection plans or RCPs. And again, these are continuing to grow from strength and strength with more RCPs being published and made available. These are in the member area, and you can see on the screen there the range of ones that have been approved and the workshops that have been held and those reports are coming out. So these RCPs are an amazing process to identify which species we should be keeping in our ERs and members and why, really making sure that we're meeting that saving species element of our uh, vision, thinking about what capacity we have, uh, how we can do our best to look after the species in our care and their wild counterparts. And once that RCP has been approved, we move on to the next stage, and that's looking at the specific ERs ex situ programs or EEPs within that RCP. And then this then digs down into the specifics of, of those programs and how they are run, and looking at the specific roles and goals for those programs. And again, just a few examples of the many new style EEPs that have been approved in the last 12 months. And again, a lovely range of species. Just like Edith had to go away and look up what the, the uh, uh, pika was, I was like, what are these tooth carps? What are these pupfishes? There was an amazing range of species that I got to learn about as part of these RCP processes and EEPs. And you can find out more about um, those are updated in our e-news to tell you which of those programs have come on board. And so as we are transitioning through this population management process, we're seeing more and more of these new style EEPs being developed each year. We're up to 449 of those now and we're seeing fewer of the old style EEPs and ESBs. So within the next couple of years, we won't have the old style EEPs and ESBs, we'll all be in new style EEPs. And the element of these EEPs are that they are fit for purpose for the species that they're there. So we've moved away from a one size fits all to really thinking about what's needed to conserve that species, to manage it in our care and support wild conservation efforts as well. And that real sort of thought then comes into the long-term management plans. So the RCP is that big picture about what species we're going to keep and why. The EEPs is saying, okay, well, how is that program going to be structured? And then our long-term management plan is the real sort of four to five years of what we're needing to do to achieve those roles and goals. And again, a really good range of these long-term management plans that have been uh, uh, completed. You can find them on the member area and new ones coming out all the time. So if you want to know more about um, you know, what are the plans for that species within your zoo or aquarium, uh, what we should be doing, are we growing the population, are we not, and why, you can find all that information in the long-term management plan. These are absolutely um, a community effort. They involve a lot of expertise, and I really do thank everybody that's been involved in the process of turning these around and making them available to members. And of course, if you're excited about the EEPs or you want to know more, or you're trying to explain the complex ERs of systems to maybe somebody that's new to the system or wants to know more, I would highly recommend our EEP pages. These are on the main public area of the website and being added to all the time as those RCPs, EEPs, and LTMPs come online. In fact, there's too many of them. I couldn't screen grab the whole page. You've only got a short bit here. There are indeed more. But this is where you can be, just like me, okay, so there's this pupfish EEP. What is, what is that about? I, I, that's something I don't know. And so you can click on the pupfish. You can get an exciting picture that I used in my presentation. You can find out who's managing that program, the status of that program. You can click into the member area and get into the long-term management plans, etc. Or you can scroll down the page, and there in the public view, you can see the identified roles and goals that we have for that species. And these vary depending on the different EEP. As I said, it's... It's what works for that particular species. What are the identified roles and goals it has within our collections? And so, so this is where for the pupfish, it has some direct conservation roles and some indirect ones. And as I said, they're different for different species, but it's great for explaining why we have those um, species in the ERs and members. And then further down that page, you can find some more specific information. 
for example, within our pupfishes, it's not just a single species, it's a range of different ones that we group together in that programme. You can see some of the other publications and partners that we work with. So I highly recommend having a look and publicising these EEP pages if you want to find out more about some of the programme species that we have, or indeed explain our work to other people as well. And moving from on from the animal uh, to its genetic elements, the EASA Biobank has continued to also go from strength to strength. Thank you to everybody that's been collecting those samples and sending them into one of our four biobank hubs so that we're able to have a really good genetic representation of the species in our care. We've done a lot of communication about the biobank, and hopefully you are all aware of it by now and know how to collect those samples, how to send them in. And of course, we've been working with our partners, Species V60, on the biobank module in Zim so that we're able to have a really good record of the uh, samples that we've been collecting. And one of the big pushes that we've been uh, involved in in the past year has been trying to get historical samples into the collection as well. So massive kudos to Sirza for giving us a thousand samples to add to our collection. Lots of exciting work there, but really adding to the reference ranges and information we have in the biobank. And the biobank is just one part. We also recognise that there's cryopreservation that needs to happen as well. And we're working with partners there to kind of expand those cryopreservation opportunities to supplement the work that we do within the biobank. And all of this, all of this uh, collection and information is all about data and what we can do with the data, the scientific decisions we can make based on the information that we have. And that's where, with the more and more samples within the biobank, we're able to do more and more research to make good decisions about population management, to look into elements of animal care and welfare and share that in a global scale as well and not just keep it within the ER as a community. So thanks again to everybody for adding their samples. Please do continue to do so. Looking at our second focal area here, this is all about conservation. And this is my annual plug to encourage members to add their data to the EASA Conservation Database. We're able to highlight all the amazing conservation projects that you're involved in through a variety of different uh, communications on our social media, on our website, and of course, in the annual report that Endo referred to in his presentation. And having this information within our database is vital so that we're able to give um, a, a view, an overview of the conservation work carried out by EASA members. And we're able to sort of represent that view to help people find out what work we're doing or maybe connect members with species or projects or areas that they may wish to expand their conservation work into. And that's all um, facilitated by our conservation database map, again, available on the public website. So if, maybe like me, you've moved from pit, pupfish to pigs, you've kept with the letter P, but you've swapped to species, you know, well, I want to know what's going on in pigs and peccaries. What work is happening here? So then you can filter by your particular species, or indeed member or habitat, whatever, and then you can see the range of projects in the database involving this species, and maybe make connections with those that are already doing research uh, to make sure we're not duplicating efforts, or that we can work together to maximise those efforts. And all that information we can collect together in these infographics, an amazingly valuable tool to demonstrate to stakeholders, to other interested parties about the conservation work of EASA members. And so this is where we were with the 2020 data. We always add the data from the year before. And so we recognize that in 2020, well, that was COVID times, that was tough times for everybody. So we did see um, a really good amount of conservation work going on, but it was a little bit of a dip on the year before. And this is where we expected 2021 to see a bit of an increase. And I absolutely know that conservation work is going out in our IADA members there. However, I think 2021 also brought a lot of um, still lag of COVID times and um, difficulty with staff times, because what we see is a decrease, a slight decrease in members adding data to the conservation database for 2021. And that, of course, brings down our overall numbers on uh, species that we're working with, partners that we're working with, money committed. And so this is where we see a dip in 2021, but I feel it's because we haven't had enough members adding data to the database. And so this is where I kind of glare out at the audience, congratulating everybody that has added their data, but having a bit of a firm stare for those that haven't. We really do encourage you to add your data to the conservation database. As I say, I know the work is going on, and I know there can be some time implications to adding the data, but without it, we're not able to put this information together. We're not able to demonstrate the amazing conservation work that's going on in our community. We're not able to connect people to the conservation work that we're doing. And that's a kind of a failing on our part. So I really do encourage you to add your data to work, to go back to your institutions 
and speak to your colleagues about how they can add data, how we can support you within the executive office to add data. So that when I'm standing here this time next year, we see a massive increase and really representing the work that we do. Because we're also able to track that work over time in infographics like this over a five year period. You know, when we're in our strategic period now, we have our new vision about saving species. I'd really love us to be able to use our infographics, use our conservation database work to give us some data to show that this is the species that we're saving, these are the areas we're working in. So please do add that data. Another important area of our work is our campaigns. And I'm not going to say too much more about the 21 plus campaign. I have a plenary on that later on today, so I'll encourage you all to attend and find out more. Moving on to our third focal area, all about representation and a big area for representation throughout this year and in a few short weeks time is the CITES COP. And we've been doing a lot of preparation work uh, for this. It's a really good opportunity and an area in our strategy that EASA has increased our capacity and stepped up into so that we can be present and involved in the variety of debates and voting and um, discussions that are going on at CITES that can influence how we manage animals in our care. And there's a lot going on and I just wanted to highlight um, one of the particular events that we're extremely proud of is our side event that's going to be all about songbirds. Those of you in the room will remember about our silent forest campaign and the importance of songbirds and um, supporting their conservation. And this work has continued on after the campaign with this um, special uh, session at CITES where we're going to highlight and encourage the listing of species so that they can have greater protection under CITES legislation. And those listing processes are also informed by the work um, of our tags as well, in terms of which of the species do we feel uh, have the right information, need most information. So an absolute big thank you to all of the tags that responded to our requests for information on your species to help us inform EASA positions on the listing processes. And so some of the key topics and activities that we're gonna be involved in during the COP are discussions around the trade in um, uh, live African elephants, a lot of work about purpose codes and acceptable and appropriate destinations. These are all elements about how you define a zoo. Is it conservation work if animals are moving? Is it trade, etc.? So a lot of really important stuff that's vital to the smooth running of our uh, community. And we're also having discussions at CITES about uh, their role in um, uh, risk, disease risk of future zoonoses and about transport of live specimens. So an awful lot of work. Um, has been going on and will continue to go on in that important CITES forum. On a more European level, we've uh, been continuing our work with the EU Zoos Directive Implementation Project that finished um, earlier this year with a stakeholder meeting where we were able to present on the EASA activities involved in conservation and linked to our EASA 21 Plus campaign. And we're looking to continue on with that work and expand on the trainings that we carried out earlier this year with zoo inspectors to kind of help them understand what it means to run a zoo or aquarium, what some of the licensing requirements are and the levels of commitment that we'd expect to see. So watch this space for further developments within EU Zoo's directive implementation training. We've also been involved in a lot of work to do with invasive, invasive alien species. And again, our tags, you guys have been super busy this year, giving feedback to the listing processes again, making sure that we have the right information about any species that get put on the invasive alien species list and have those associated restrictions with them. We've also been involved in a project on humane management of invasive alien species. Uh, the, the devastating effects of invasive alien species on native species is a really big um, topic across um, Europe and indeed for the European Union and Commission. And we want to be involved in helping support that process so that management techniques for managing these species are humane and they are informed by the latest scientific developments that we're able to provide from our expertise as a community. And that also leads on to the third bullet point here under IAS is about communications. Because of course we have all of our amazing visitors that come to our zoos and aquariums and opportunities there to raise their awareness about the dangers of invasive alien species when it comes to maybe some of the pets and not releasing them back out into the wild or when it comes to activities like fishing and making sure that cleaning of fishing gear is appropriate. If you're interested in more about invasive alien species, we have some updates in our EU sessions uh, later today, and then the invasive alien species session, I think is on Saturday, but maybe check your program. There's definitely a lot going on. And last but not least, in terms of this slide, of course, we've been continuing our work on the animal health law. 
we've been uh, partnering with EAZWC and um, state veterinarians to develop uh, an EU animal health law handbook that's going to tell you all about what this legislation means, how it can be managed so that we can sort of effectively safeguard the health of species and transport movements around what are so vital for our programmes. And of course, you know, I mentioned COVID, I have to mention Brexit as well, some exciting topics to talk about. Um, so I'm super aware, I just mentioned animal health law and transport, and I know, oh my goodness, do I know the difficulties that we're all experiencing transferring animals between the UK and EU and vice versa. Absolute applause for anybody that's persevered through that process, and I would encourage you to continue doing so. I know there's a lot of paperwork, I know it changes all the time, but we are working with colleagues in Bayaza and we are making progress. And the progress can only be made when we keep trying and we keep doing those efforts. So we've got some movement on ungulates, we've got some new work on captive birds, and we'll continue to help make that process um, as easier as possible. But we really do need you as that community effort to keep sharing your experiences, what's working, what's not working, and uh, you know, communicating with our policy team and the Bayaza colleagues so that we can help push this forwards and really have all of those important transfers happening that are vital for our programmes. And if all of this talk about EU lobby work has got you excited and you want to do more, oh my goodness, yes, I love legislation. I want to have my voice known. I want to know how this legislation is going to impact me and I want to be the one that can influence it as well. We have our in-person study tour going ahead this year in December. If you're interested in visiting Brussels and getting involved in the processes and finding out more, please do contact Alan and we'd be really pleased to welcome you to Brussels later on this year. And of course, I've mentioned partnerships a lot, and really this is the, the vital part of our work, because if we do want to save species, we do want to, to do the good work that we're doing, we can't do it alone. We have to do it in partnership because the problems are so big. And so I'd like to thank everybody that's partnered with us and everybody that's working on expanding and making those partnerships work, because this really is putting the with you element into our vision. I'm going to move looking at the time, fairly speedily through some of the communication updates because some of these, or in fact all of these, you hopefully should have seen through our various social media channels or through the e-news. But I just wanted to highlight now the variety of document updates that have taken place. We've had some updates to the Population Management Manual to do with EP Vice Coordinator positions. We've had some updates to the standards for accommodation and care in terms of elements to do with natural behaviour, um, animal tra uh, training and demonstrations and reproductive management. So check those out, they were approved in April. We also had some updates to our sanctions document to make the language and the processes clearer to people. And that uh, fed into updates in the membership and accreditation manual because sections in there refer to these previous documents. But also, again, maybe linked to that partnership work, we have a lot of members that are also members of national associations or of WASA. We want to make sure that we're communicating effectively between all of those organizations about our joint members. Also in April this year, our research standards got updated and so unapproved. So uh, we have some uh, exciting research standards available now from the website that our members are asked to follow. And again, I won't say too much about those because we have a plenary later on on Saturday, which will introduce them to you and the work of research going on in our collections. And not to be left out, I've nearly mentioned every single document that we have. We've also got our extraordinary AGM uh, on Saturday as well, where we're looking to discuss and approve our EASA field conservation standards. I know on the programme it said that that meeting was a closed meeting and that was a mistake. It is an open meeting. Everybody's welcome to come and attend. Uh, it's the full members that get to vote uh, in the annual general meeting on these standards, but everybody can come. Of course, if you are a vote holder, please do come. If you are not in the room and a vote holder, please do send your proxy. So if you know there's somebody not here, we do need to make sure that we have sufficient votes in the room. So if there's members um, that uh, uh, we want their votes to be heard in relation to these standards, then please um, uh, come and talk to me or discuss how we can have their proxy in the room if they're not able to attend. And we have a whole range of our publications. Andre mentioned our annual report and tag report, just the wealth of work um, uh, and success stories in those has been amazing. So thank you to everybody for that work. And of course, we can publicize them through our Zuquaria editions as well. I do want to take a special pause to congratulate JZAR on reaching its 10 year anniversary. I remember um, when I very first started with the Yards some of the early discussions about, are we gonna have this open access journal? How's it going to be, etc. And for it to be going strong 10 years in and um, seriously high quality of publications. We have a good team 
uh, behind the scenes, making sure that we're able to process things effectively is really great work. So I'm super pleased on that. And also, we now um, have early online, so you don't even have to wait for JSR to come out. If there's an article that's made it through that process, you can see it in early online as well. So I really um, congratulate everybody involved in JSR. If you're a reviewer or you're a researcher submitting your work, please continue to do so. This is a, a vital product of putting our research out there so we can continue to make important scientific decisions for this species in our care. We've mentioned the Yaza book, so I'm going to skip over that slide in the interest of time and just move on to this one that is all the different ways you can keep up to date. Catch us on our socials, as the young people probably don't say anymore now. There's a new phrase, I'm sure. But uh, please do follow us um, and you can keep up to date uh, on a, a regular basis on what's happening there. And of course, we like to know about you. We like you to tag us. If you'd like to be one of our proud Zoo people or have our member takeover, please do contact Sandrine and she'll be more than happy to publicize and share your success within our social media community. And on the internal element, we have our ERs at eNews that comes out once a month. It'll give you updates like the RCPs that have been published, like the LTMPs that have been published, funding information, other changes going on in the organization as well. So sign up to eNews if you've not done that. I'm not stopping at sort of paper publications and online publications. We have a range of videos as well. So if you want to supplement the book with about what is Yaza in a presentation, we have that. And also within this focal area, we have the desire to disseminate our work more wildly, widely, wildly, widely. <laughs> and we have these um, series of Slice of Science, which is a short uh, um, uh, video presentation of one of the researchers about their piece of research and a really engaging and uh, useful opportunity to find out more about that research and understand it um, in, a, in a short video clip. And of course, on our YouTube channel, we also have uh, videos of uh, um, the events, such as the Conservation Forum, the Animal Welfare Forum, that you can go and watch, or indeed re-watch, if you want to remember what went on in that amazing presentation you saw. And all of this communication is obviously linked about us being able to communicate and everybody being a communicator. So we do have a range of infographics that are available in different languages that can help explain all these EAS acronyms and what it means. And we have our communicators network as well. And the aim of the network is that we would have quarterly meetings for our communicators so that we're able to discuss current topics, to align our communication statements, so that we're making strong communication messages um, about the wonderful work that we're doing. And so if you are a communicator or you know somebody in your team that would be interested in joining the network, then please do contact Sandrine. And that brings us onto our last focal area. And this one is about managing our operations to reduce our environmental footprint. And so we have a range of case studies in Zooquaria. And if you are involved in sustainability actions, you're doing something with waste management or water management in your institution, we would love to have more case studies in Zooquaria. So please come and speak to me and we one would welcome the opportunity to showcase your work. And we already have uh, guidelines on palm oil, but there are definitely more in the process. So again, watch this space for more support on sustainability actions that can help us reduce our environmental footprint. And I've sped through because I was aware of time, but I've taken quite a little bit of a look at the past, the past 12 months, what we've done in this last year. But I absolutely want to take this opportunity to not only thank everybody for their amazing work, but also look to the future. It's been a tough two years, but boy, has it been a busy two years. I'm so impressed about the amount of work that we've all done together under very difficult circumstances. And those circumstances aren't over. You know, we're going to hear some, some stories from our colleagues in Ukraine. There are definitely challenges ahead. But I do really believe, and I'm going to use it as well, I believe in the IASA culture. I really believe we are stronger together. And I couldn't be prouder to be part of a community of progressive zoos and aquariums saving species together with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you for your patience, and uh, especially this time, thank you for the executive office for all your support uh, which they provide for the membership.
Uh, as we are celebrating, we cannot forget about some circumstances. Uh, I'm talking about the Ukrainian war, which uh, are not only th threatening our work on the field of professions, so the animal welfare and the conservation, but also threatening with uh, humanitarian crisis. Uh, we tackled or tried to tackle this problem from the beginning on behalf of EASA and the community. We have a statement uh, which guides us all over the, this time. And uh, we set up a fundraiser. We are working from the, for, uh, with the Ukrainian Association to help and support uh, Ukrainian zoos and uh, animal holding facilities. And uh, some of the institutions set up some logistic points from where we supply uh, funds and uh, anything needed and that's personally uh, pointed by the Ukrainian Association. Uh, but this is a problem we can only handle together, so I ask uh, the community at this time as well to reconsider options, and that was not a question as well uh, by the organization of this conference that we give time for the Ukrainian colleagues uh, to speak out for their cause and, uh, and speak out for themselves. So I would like to invite uh, to the stage uh, Vladimir Topchi, the president of the Ukrainian uh, Association, and tell about their thoughts, uh, thoughts and feelings. Good day, my friends. Uh, dear President, uh, ladies, gentlemen, uh, colleagues, uh, Я хочу приветствовать вас от Украины, от зоопарков Украины, от Украины, которая сейчас утекает кровью и защищает всю Европу от страшной агрессии России. I'm, uh, I'm greeting you from Ukraine. Для того, чтобы uh, mm -hmm. нам сократить время, uh, uh, я прошу прочитать мой месседж uh, моего помощника и uh, Я не буду говорить на uh, украинском языке. Thank you. Um, to save your time, I will read this message from Vladimir Tapchey. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this high meeting, I have the honor to represent Association of Zoos of Ukraine, AZU, that united eight leading zoos of our country which in their activities are guided by the basic principles of zoo business, strive for high standards of keeping animals and represent all regions of Ukraine. First of all, on behalf of the zoos, members of a zoo, let me express our deep gratitude to all organizations from Europe, including the UK, the USA, Canada, New Zealand, Australia and Japan, that found an opportunity to support us during Russia's treacherous invasion of Ukraine. On a zoo website, all our sponsors are listed personally. Thank you to everyone who in this difficult time has extended a helping hand to those of Ukraine. I thank the EASA leadership for assuming the role of coordinator to help Ukrainian zoos during the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We are grateful to the zoos of Lodz and Warsaw and Poland for organizing regular humanitarian assistance to Ukrainian zoos. For seven months since the beginning of the war, the Russian occupiers have caused massive damage to Ukraine, killing thousands of civilians, including 400 children. We still do not know the exact number of the dead in Mariupol, Volnavakha, Izum, and other cities and towns. Russian troops leveled the cities and villages to the ground, destroyed critical infrastructure, the economy, depriving the roof of a hat and jobs of our citizens. However, they did not give up yesterday, and we are going on a counterattack today, and no doubt we will win tomorrow. All of us are united by faith in the armed forces of Ukraine, the will to win, and love for our beautiful country. As an American writer and Stephen King aptly noted, Russia thought that Ukraine was a lapdog, and it turned out to be a Wolverine. The most difficult thing for everyone was the first months of the war. Massive shelling and bombing, shortage of food and feed, fuel, problems with logistics, water and electricity. There was a total destruction of infrastructure, fear of the unknown, mass fleeing of the population, inflation, 
winter. It was freezing cold until the end of March. The war has united us and organized us. It gave us baptism of fire. Each of our zoos now has its own military history, as well as a history of assistance and mutual assistance. All ASU members, without an exception, participated in evacuation. They took care of housing animals from zoos, pets corners, and zoo centers of various forms of ownership from those parts of the countries where there were hostilities. For example, from Feldman Echo Park in the suburbs of Kharkiv and the zoo 12 months near Kyiv. From temporarily occupied territories such as Berdyansk Zoo, Safari Park on the Arbatska Strilka, a reserve and zoo Askania Nova. We also distributed and used the financial assistance that had been received on the AZU account. To do that, we created a special account UKRZU. Detailed reports on the use of all the funds were regularly submitted to IASA management. We need your help. For seven months of Russian invasion of Ukraine, the world has been used to this war. Meanwhile, the war continues and causes enormous damage to our economy, critical infrastructure, and real people. For seven months, Grivny and national Ukrainian currency has devaluated by 30%. This caused a sharp rise in price of fuel, feed, building materials, and equipment, as well as the shortage of many vital goods. Until now, logistics is significantly hampered in Ukraine. The roads are broken. A lot of bridges are blown up. No civilian airport is open. When it primarily comes to supporting the armed forces of Ukraine, wounded soldiers, homeless and unemployed people, orphan children, it becomes clear that financing of anything else is reduced to a minimum. Ten millions of our citizens had to flee abroad. People's incomes have fallen sharply. Accordingly, revenues from ticket sales at the zoos have fallen many times. Meanwhile, all migrants are provided with free visits. Since February 2022, the Ukrainian zoos have been in a permanent high-risk sector. With the help and support of zoos in Europe, the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, we managed to hold out until the period of cold weather. Today, we do need help to purchase fuel, generators, materials for insulation of premises, animal feed, etc. All our needs have a specific focus, that is surviving the winter. winter. We should remember that winter is coming, and in many areas of Ukraine, the temperature drops minus 20 degrees Celsius. As previously reported, a zoo distributes the received funds not only to its members, but also it helps other institutions that are in urgent need of help. We really hope that next year will bring us victory and relief. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you for your attention and support. Uh. And еще раз большое спасибо за вашу поддержку. Спасибо Яза за то, что вы рядом с нами. Thank you, Yaza, that you are close to us, that you are with us. Спасибо от всех украинских зоопарков и тех, кто сейчас находится на оккупированной территории. Thank you from all Ukrainian zoos, especially from those that are on occupied territories. Две ночи, две ночи подряд бомбят Николаев. Разрушены практически все школы, детские сады, университеты. Two nights in a row, Mykolaiv is bombing. Uh, all schools, universities, theaters are destroyed. Это ничем не оправданная агрессия сумасшедшего лидера одной сумасшедшей страны. Поэтому я принес сюда наш флаг, флаг нашей Украины. Поддержите Украину, мы победим. That's why I bring the Ukrainian flag here, because we can't apologize Russian, it's aggression. And thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you.
it's really hard to say anything about this report. I just thank you very much uh, for your openness. Uh, this is a brave thing you are doing here. And I, I believe and I know that the strength of this community will guide us together the crisis. And uh, so I'm asking everyone to keep on with this enthusiasm, keep together, uh, keep this uh, association together and find uh, the common joint solution for tackling this problem as well. Thank you very much. And uh, let's try to get back and uh, celebrate. And I wish you, everyone, a nice conference, fruitful meetings. Uh, this is the most happy point of the conference when I officially open uh, the EASA annual conference. Let's enjoy your time. <laughs>